glad that we're all here together this morning to worship the Lord. Will you please stand? To start off with this morning, I would like you to just close your eyes, and I want you to picture the throne room in heaven as it is described here in Revelation. So close your eyes and see if you can never stop saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Wherever, whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, O Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. Let's worship our maker and creator this morning. He is here with us, and he deserves all of our praise. We worship the God who was, we worship the God who is, we worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors, he parted the raging sea, my God, he holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord, there's joy in the house of the Lord today, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. Oh, we shout out your praise. Oh, we sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way. Cause he hung up on that cross and he rose up from the grave. My God still rolling stones away. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Redeemed by his grace, let the house of the Lord sing praise. Cause we were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by his grace. the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today, and we won't be Praise. 
and greet one another this morning. Head back to your seat, it's time for announcements. Welcome to Maple Avenue Christian Church, a great place to connect, grow, serve, and share. We hope that through today's service, you'll connect with God and build community with Christ followers. Please fill out a connection card to get involved, volunteer, or update your contact information. You can also use one to let us know how to pray for you this week. 
Stay in the loop, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Don't forget to turn on the notifications so you don't miss a thing. To be added to our email updates, please contact the church office. Before we get started, please take a moment to silence your phone. Here's what's going on at MACC. All women are welcome to join us for our annual appetizer party at our next Women's Friendship Circle tomorrow at 6.30 p.m. In the atrium, please bring an appetizer to share with the group. Our next discovered dinner is Monday, November 11th at 6 p.m. in the atrium. If you're new to MACC or have never attended Discover Dinner before, call the church office or fill out a connection card to make your reservation. This month's sermon series focuses on growing in God's Word. Check it out in the adult ministries area for resources that can aid you in your study of the Bible. There are guides, pamphlets, and study notes in Right Now Media series available, so please stop by that area after service. Be sure to bring your kids to MACC on Thursday, October 31st from 5 to 7 p.m. For GLOW, this community event will have free games, inflatables, and candy. We will also have free hot dogs, chips, and bottled water. Don't forget to wear your costumes. See you then. Thank you for worshiping with us today. Be sure to check us out online to stay updated throughout the week. But for now, you can't say we didn't tell ya. Welcome this morning, everyone. We're glad to have you here, and if you're joining us online, we'd love to see you here soon. Um, my name is Jason Segelke. I'm the Creative Media and Communications Minister here at Maple Avenue, and we've been going over the past few Sundays about looking at the treasure that is God's Word, a treasure more precious than silver or gold, providing instruction, comfort, and hope, all while pointing us to Jesus. Yet, it's the least read bestseller in the world. Unlocking its treasure is like a marathon, taking preparation and dedication over time. To grow in our faith, we must study God's word. Who likes to be scrutinized? Hands? Hand? I mean, you see a microscope and you're like, get me under that thing. I want to be studied. Pick me apart. Show me all my flaws. Nobody? Nobody? Of course not. Nobody likes to be scrutinized or studied. That's why we have to pay people to be test subjects. I was trying to think of an example for an illustration that gets us thinking about the idea of us being the subject of study. And then I remembered this picture that I took for my kids when I had a sleep study done. Aren't you glad I haven't had a colonoscopy yet? <laughs> so this is when I had a sleep study done and they hooked up all kinds of wires and straps to me and they hooked up beeping machines and they said, okay, now sleep. I tell you what, I've got four kids at home. That was one of the best nights of sleep I've had in a while. But I was the subject of their study. Being studied is a necessary part, it was a necessary part of improving my sleep and my overall health. Allowing the Word of God to study us is a necessary part of our discipleship. When we let the Word study us after we've studied the Word, God shows us how to grow. Will you stand with me as we read Hebrews 4, 12 through 13? Just a couple verses here. Hebrews 4, chapters, Hebrews 4, verses 12 through 13. For the Word of, the, of God is alive and active, Sharper than any double-edged sword, it penetrates even dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all of creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him 
to whom we must give account. Thank you. Please be seated. And will you pray with me? Uh, Father, we've given a lot of time talking about the importance of studying your word and how to study your word. God, help us to have the same fervor to understand what it means for your word to study us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So let's break this passage down just a bit. Hebrews 12, uh, Hebrews 4, chat, verse 12, we see part of and understand the nature of God's word. For the word of God is alive and active. Well, that's not what that means. Those really work. I'm glad I didn't bump it. When I, okay. <laughs> so what does it mean for the word of God to be alive and active? It's important to remember that each book of the Bible was first written to its original audience for its original purpose. But the God of the universe, who sees from the beginning of time to the end of time, without turning his head, has guided the writers of each text to send a message that would speak loudly to us today as well. That's what Hebrews 4.12 means when it says the word of God is alive and active. It means that the message of Scripture never dies and never stops. What was written to the original audience lives on with meaning for us today. Just as the Israelites needed the Shema to know that the Lord our God, the Lord is one, we need to hear today that the Father, Son, and Spirit are one. Just as Jesus told Martha, I am the resurrection and the life, the one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever believe, lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Each of us must answer that same question today. And just as Jesus issues the great commission to the disciples, go and make disciples of all nations, we answer that call of that commission now. Other books, not, not, not other books of the Bible, but just other books, are written, and before the first edition is even bound, the author is brainstorming what to say in the next book. The Word of God needs no follow-up. It doesn't need a sequel. It is alive and active, speaking to us today, just as it did 2,000 years ago. And beyond, if you count the Old Testament too, which we do. I'm going to state something here that I know is going to seem completely obvious to some of you. But remember, I'm trying to speak to a broad audience today, so I want to make sure I, I, I hit this. But remember, we do not worship the Bible. I know that that gets confused with some people. The Bible is not alive and active in some kind of mystical way. I had a friend in high school. I used to take my Bible with me to different classes, and actually all my classes, my freshman year, and he was in biology class with me, and he noticed that I had brought my Bible with me. So in a joking way, he acted like if he were to touch it, it was going to burn him, okay? <laughs> he, was, he was being silly, but he was also like, you know, trying to, you know, pick on me or whatever with that. But this is a printed book, and it came off the same press as many other books. The Bible's not God. We don't worship the Bible, okay? But while the Bible itself is not God, it contains his will. To know the Bible is to know part of who God is. To allow the Bible to judge and guide us is to allow God to judge and guide us, for it's his will. But are we listening? Maybe, maybe not. 
We might not always want to because the Word of God is alive and active, but it cuts. Sharper than any double-edged sword, it penetrates, even dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. My wife, Jamie, she gets up every morning before all of us, even our three-year-old if she's lucky. She makes her way to the couch and she reads her Bible, but she doesn't turn on the lights. No, she doesn't have superpowers seen in the dark. She uses the flashlight on her phone and points it at the Bible. And I know it's my wife sitting there, for one, because I didn't hear any break, anybody break into the house, and that would be the weirdest breaking and entering ever, to sit down and read your Bible in somebody else's house. But I know it's her because the light she shines on the Bible reflects back on to her. That little smartphone light doesn't just reveal the text, it reveals her. When we study God's word and unlock the treasures within, those sparkling nuggets of wisdom and truth, they have this inconvenient tendency to shine back on us. It doesn't just illuminate the truth, it illuminates us. It's inescapable. That's what a double-edged sword does. It cuts both ways. The main thing I want you to consider from the message today, I want you to remember that there is a necessary step between studying God's word and applying God's word. We must reflect on God's word. Once we've studied the Bible, we must let the Bible study us. It's a necessary part of our discipleship. Now, this doesn't mean that the Bible hooks up wires and straps and listens to us snore, like, it, like in my sleep study. It means that we open ourselves up to scrutiny. Wow, preacher, that sounds real fun. <laughs> Nobody likes to be scrutinized. But important things aren't always fun. Consider all of the things we do when we study the Word. When we study the Bible, we go through commentaries, Bible dictionaries. Uh, we study history and context and circumstances. We look for patterns and themes. We confer with other Christians to see if our understanding is correct. Why would we do all of that with God's perfect Word and then think that we're out of bounds, that somehow we're off limits from study. We have to allow the truth we discover in Scripture to examine us back. In effect, this is part of how we allow God to examine us. John Stott, a Christian theologian, put it much better than I could. We need to repent of the haughty way in which we sometimes stand in judgment upon Scripture, and we must learn to sit humbly under its judgments instead. If we come to Scripture with our minds made up, expecting to hear from it only an echo of our own thoughts and never the thunderclap of God's, then indeed we will not, he will not speak to us and we shall only be confirmed in our prejudices. We must allow the word of God to confront us, to disturb our security, and to undermine our complacency, complacency and to overthrow our patterns of thought and behavior. And even as well as he stated that, Psalm 139 states it even better. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. If we walked away and we just prayed that prayer from Scripture to God this whole week, 
that would be an accomplishment. That would be progress. Let's make that a prayer point for this week, to pray this scripture back to God that he might search us out. David, the writer of this psalm, is extending an invitation to God. He's opening the door to his heart and letting God in. And we might as well continue on with me in the second verse of our passage. Nothing in all of creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before his eyes uh, uh, to him who we must give account. To God, we are all open books. We can't keep secrets from him. We can't spin the truth. What is, is. Even so, letting down our defenses, even with God, can be so hard. But it's so necessary to truly encounter God through his word. Earlier, I called this reflection a necessary step between study and application. But don't think of it as a box to check off. You may apply God's word and then come back to reflection and back and forth for a while as God wrestles with our hearts. Allowing God's word to study us is something, it's not something that we do in a single afternoon or in a single sitting. It's an attitude that we cultivate. Don't expect to reap the benefits of Scripture without sowing commitment. The Bible is not a bank to be robbed. I mean, think about what people do when they rob a bank. Okay, I'm not talking about every little bit like the radios and stuff, but essentially what they do when they rob a bank. They try to reap the rewards, money, of a commitment that they did not make work and time. Or consider crash diets. We want to get skinny quick, so we eat like rabbits and we spin the tires off stationary bikes only to gain it back when we only hand out half the candy that we bought for Halloween. There are no shortcuts to letting God's word study us. It is a long-term commitment to let God use his word to search us out, correct us, and lead us. Okay, that's the importance of it. That's why we do it. That's why it's important. How do we do this? How do we let God's word study us? I think a lot, in a lot of ways, what we talked about last week with studying scripture, those principles of Bible study can be flipped back onto us and allowing the word to study us. We need to understand our own context. Part of letting scripture study us is realizing that we have history. We have baggage. When we read the Bible, we don't come to it empty-handed. We come to it sitting in 2024 in America, in the Midwest, right before an election. Some of us read the Bible with a comfortable bank account and a sour relationship with our siblings. Some of us read the Bible with three kids and a tough work project waiting for us. Some of us read the Bible with a large portion of Scripture memorized and cancer. We all have baggage, context, stuff we bring with us to the text. We can't help it. It's there but we can recognize it and account for it. What we know or think we know influences how we read something. So we need to consider that when we study God's word. Another part of understanding our own context is, is knowing that we have desired meanings. We may want the Bible to say certain things about certain topics. For example, and I know that this hits many people, and I'm, I'm sensitive to it, but we may 
want the Bible to teach a certain thing about baptism so that it lines up with the way that our parents and grandparents practiced. We might pick out certain verses that reinforce what we want to think about tithes and offerings. We might want the Bible to teach that hell is a place of eternal conscious torment because we want certain people to get what we think they deserve. Or we might want the Bible to teach that hell is mainly a place of separation from God because we want to be lazy about evangelism. By the way, both motives are wrong. <laughs> and also with the baggage, with our context, we have to admit that we can have hard hearts. Our desire to stay the same can block us from understanding God's word. A fear of change can keep us from seeking the fullness of Scripture's truth. Because to really understand Scripture, to really understand a, packet, a passage, may come with a conviction to obey. All of these things and others, our own context can skew our understanding of God's word, but by admitting it and considering it when we study, and after that, as we let it study us, God's word can reach into every corner of our lives. And once we've uh, let scripture uh, study our context, we submit ourselves to the whole of Scripture. Ooh, what does that mean? It means that we give each part of Scripture access to our hearts so that all parts of Scripture can study us. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. That's not just teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training other people. <laughs> That's correcting, teaching, rebuking, and training ourselves. When we study a passage of Scripture, we interpret that passage with the whole of Scripture in mind. And since all of Scripture is authoritative and internally consistent, one part is going to complement and agree with all other parts once good study and interpretation has taken place. We could all find just a handful of passages that we want, that we would love to invite into our lives. Imagine this. Imagine if the only few verses that you studied and let's study you were John 3.16 Philippians 4.13 and Matthew 7.1. You guys all know those by heart right off the bat. No, I'm, I'll go there. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Philippians 4.13. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. And Matthew 7.1. Judge not lest ye be judged. So as long as I believe in Jesus, and I can do anything, and I can just be chill with everybody. All right, all right, all right. If that's all you know, then the rest of Scripture doesn't get a voice in your life. You don't know that other verses say that even demons believe in Jesus, and they shudder. Or that the things that Paul could do through the strength that God gave him were endure prison, beatings, shipwrecks, nakedness, hunger, and sleeplessness. I think there was even a snake bite in there or so. Or when Paul says that it certainly is your responsibility to judge those inside the church who are sinning, 1 Corinthians 5.12, and that's in the NLT. In the same way that we must spend time in the Word, the Word must spend time in us. The Word of God can take up residence in us and come with us as we live our lives. Psalm 119, verse 11. 
I have hidden your word in my heart that I may not sin against you. Some of you are squirming right now because you know the M word is coming. You're having flashbacks to VBS, watching all the other kids rattle off John 3.16 and Genesis 1.1 and getting all kinds of candy for it, while you're sitting here with one Tootsie Roll because you managed to say Jesus wept, but you couldn't remember the book, the, the book chapter and verse. Don't laugh, you still don't know the book, chapter, and verse. I'm not going to give you a list of scriptures that you need to memorize to be a good Christian. But the more familiar that we are with scripture, the more opportunity we give God's word to search us out in moments that we aren't actively reading the Bible the Holy Spirit can bring back to us God's word at teachable moments. John 14, 26, But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. The Holy Spirit can remind us of what we've read, but good luck remembering something that you haven't spent time with or committed to memory. We live in a really amazing time. I know memorization is not everybody's thing. But for a long time, that if we wanted to find a passage, we would have to drag out a huge book called a concordance or a Bible dictionary or Bible outlines and try to find that verse if we didn't know what it was. We live in a time where you take a thing out of your pocket, and if you're familiar enough with what you're looking for, you can say a key phrase from that verse, like, uh, hide your word. If that's all you remember, you can search that, and guess what? Google, evil Google, will send you to the right verse probably, I don't know, I don't know a real statistic here, so I'll tell you, I'll say, you know, 99 times out of 100, because I don't know an actual statistic there. But you can find that, and then once you've got that verse reference, you can go to a Bible app that you trust, so you're not just going to any website. We live in amazing times for finding God's Word. Now, finally, we need to open yourself up to God and to others. Just like we count on reading and studying the Bible in community to discover the meaning of a passage, we can flip that back onto ourselves to allow the passage to study us. This one takes a lot of humility because here's how it can play out. Someone else who is a brother, a trusted brother or sister in Christ has studied the same Bible you have and at a time that you may be asking or may not be asking, they may help you see what the Bible means and how it may apply to your life. This is a great feeling when it's a word of encouragement or affirmation. But if it's challenging or corrective, it can feel like being judged or attacked. But God's word isn't just for Facebook memes, and greeting cards. It is to develop us as disciples, ready to do good works, just as God planned for us. Colossians 6, 13, let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. We are called to teach and admonish one another. It's part of the word refining us. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. 
Nothing in all of creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Let us each commit ourselves today to inviting God to search us through his word. We must brave the scrutiny that comes with letting scripture study us. And in doing so, when we let the word study us, God shows us how to grow. Will you pray with me? Oh, Father, you've given us your word, and it is not just a dusty book from a long time ago. God, you've given us a word that is alive and active, and you are ready to teach and refine and help us through its meaning. God, help us to submit ourselves to being studied by your word, that we might go on to apply it as your disciples. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you've never made that choice to be a disciple of Jesus, if you've never found salvation in him, or you have no idea what I'm talking about right now, that's, that's fine. <laughs> Come forward. Ask us about that. But if you just need prayer and help with letting Scripture look back at you, there will be people all around the worship center today ready to pray with you. Will you please stand? As we sing this next song, um, just let it be a prayer of your heart this morning. my heart, oh God, make it ever true, change my heart, oh God, may I be like you, you Change my heart, oh God, may I be like you. And oh, to Jesus I surrender all to him.
be seated. We are blessed that we no longer live under the old covenant or the law. Jesus came to fulfill the law, which was incomplete because we did not have the power to fulfill it ourselves. Thankfully, God had a plan and Christ Jesus ushered us from the old covenant to the new on the cross. We're thankful for God's grace given to us through Christ Jesus, our Lord, a grace that has liberated us from the burden of the law. The new covenant instituted by Jesus through his blood wasn't just an amendment to the old covenant, but a complete renewal. In Hebrews 8, 1 through 7, in verses 13 as well, tells us how Jesus, the high priest under the new covenant, offers both gifts and sacrifices with the incredible distinction of being the final sacrifice, which makes the old covenant obsolete. Here's what these verses say. I'm reading from actually the message. In essence, we have just such a high priest, authoritative right alongside God, conducting worship in the one true sanctuary built by God. The assigned task of a high priest is to offer both gifts and sacrifices, and it's no different with the priesthood of Jesus. If he were limited to earth, he wouldn't even be a priest. We wouldn't need him, since there are plenty of priests who offer the gifts designated in the law. These priests provided only a hint of what was of what goes on in the true sanctuary of heaven, which Moses caught a glimpse of as he was about to set up the tent shrine. Then God said, be careful to do it exactly as you saw it on the mountain. Verse 13, but Jesus' priestly work for, far surpasses what these other priests do. He's working from a far better plan that the first plan, the old covenant, had worked out a second wouldn't have been needed. In verse 13, we're told by calling his covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete, and what is obsolete and outdated will soon disappear. Thanks to Christ's sacrifice, we're no longer bound and led by the law. The indwelling, of <clears throat> the indwelling Holy Spirit now leads us, providing us with reassurance and comfort in our earthly journey. 
As we take this communion together this morning, let it remind us of this everlasting covenant God, from God that allows us to have a proper relationship with him. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you for you sending your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you that you loved us so much that you sent your son to the cross to die a cruel death, to be resurrected, and to be Lord of our lives. We thank you for that. We thank you that you loved us so much to do that. Father, we just, again, give you thanks. We thank you that, that we have eternal salvation through Christ's obedience to you. And I pray this in his name. this time, as we have um, are given an opportunity to give back what God has entrusted in us, that as we give these gifts back to him through obedience, that we do so with a heart filled with joy. So shall we pray? Father, we thank you for this time that we set aside each Lord's Day to also be obedient to you in this matter of giving. And we just pray that, um, that as we give, we give with a heart that is filled with joy. And we thank you for entrusting this to us. And Father, help us to be obedient and giving back that portion which you ask. And we pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Will you please stand? I want to echo a prayer that Jason read this morning that's in scripture that David prayed from Psalm 139 verses 23 through 24 and David prayed search me O God and know my heart test me and know my anxious thoughts see if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting so let's declare our devotion to our Lord and Savior by inviting him to continue to work in our hearts this week so just like Jason said, just if we could pray that prayer every day, like before our head gets off the pillow, Lord, search me, know me, teach me, um, he, help me to walk in, in your way. And he will. He is our good shepherd, and he is faithful. So let's sing this next song and just declare that Christ is all that we need. Christ is my reward and all of my devotion. Now there's nothing in this world that could ever satisfy. Through every 
love to meet you and get to know you better if you just go through those doors where the red wall is they have a package for you and everyone else we need to move all the chairs this week so if everybody could pitch in that would be so great we've got um, all the dollies in the back each row goes on one dolly I think you guys know the routine so you guys have a great week have a blessed week